Is this on? Cool. CSS. CSS. Whoa. Cascading scale sheets. We all know how CSS works, right? Or we just make it work eventually by throwing stuff at it until it works. <laughs> And CSS is simple, kind of in the same way that a thread is simple, right? We could just make amazing things out of it uh, that look good and is an amazing experience. But we, on behind the scenes, probably see this, something like this, which is a mess to work in, especially, for example, if your designer comes and wants to turn this into something like this, <laughs> like exactly the same but completely different. <laughs> You'd be like, OK, that's going to be a nightmare. So we're going to talk about today uh, how we do not end up here, how we scale CSS in the mean lean CSS machine. And we're going to talk about four things, uh, mainly uh, GitHub setup, the general setup of the style sheets, uh, good CSS conventions, testing and linting, and then doing some refactoring. And we're going to mix uh, tech and design here, so uh, more design towards the end. Before that, though, a short introduction. Toby, that's me. That's my name. That's what most people call me. Uh, this is my full name. It's Tobias Salin. Uh, this is where you'll find me on Twitter and GitHub and everything else. Uh, Shuttle about me. This is the latest book that I read. This is the, one of my favorite albums. This is a town that I come from. It's on the west coast of Sweden. Around there, it always rains in Sweden. So kind of like Brighton, but everyone I call Glenn for some reason. Uh, I currently don't live there anymore. I'm a nomad, so I just go around and do stuff right now. I'm in Brighton, and I live here, and that feels great. Uh, I used to work at Spotify, so I worked there for a few years and did product design and focused on iOS, um, iPad and iPhone, but also uh, the native clients for Mac and Windows and the web product. So I did design there for a few years, uh, then went into a cave and learned Objective-C for some reason, released the game, and then stopped doing that and went to GitHub. And I was at GitHub for about a little bit more than a year, but just actually quit two weeks ago. So I made this presentation while I was at GitHub. So I'm going to say we a lot of time as I'm at GitHub, but that's not true anymore. So if that confuses you, just think we equals GitHub, although it's false. This is where I work right now. It's a company in Sweden, Stockholm, called Lookback. It focuses on use research, and it's a really cool tool. Uh, so please look that up. It's lookback.io. So if you're wondering at this point how many slides there are in this presentation, it's 183 ones. And we're just getting started, so let's just get to it, right? So GitHub setup, uh, this is uh, a uh, no-brainer, basically. Uh, we have SAS as the chosen precompiler. There are more than 100 source uh, style sheets, which of only one, basically, is a third-party one. So that's normalize uh, CSS, and then everything is just utility classes and use specific style sheets. Uh, everything is compiled down into two style sheets, and that's only because there's a limit Right, in IE9 and below, that you can't have more than 4,000 selectors per file, which is a mess. So it's called GitHub 1 and GitHub 2. Yay. Uh, that's, uh, hopefully, you wouldn't be in that position, right? So you'd have to do that. So um, the selector count I'd, on GitHub, GitHub is basically around seven, uh, 6,600. And for some context, uh, this site where we are right now, uh, 200 selectors. It's a fairly good job. Smashing Magazine, around 500. Twitter, hovering around 9,000, which is a lot, I think. SoundCloud, on the other hand, for example, they managed to get by on only 1,000 or so. So good job on them. Octicons is used on GitHub GitHub to reduce uh, the need of image assets, right? So reducing those requests, also a really great tool to work with as designers. Octicons, the, the um, open source uh, icon font uh, that's used on GitHub GitHub is actually open source. So you can use it in your projects and contribute to that. So just Google Octicons, and you'll find that. Uh, for some context, when I talk about how we work at GitHub, it's about 230 people at the company right now. And around 50% of those work with product. And there's still not much hierarchy at all. So basically, everyone encouraged to touch uh, whatever part of the product they feel confident um, like changing. So a lot of people go in and out, uh, changing basically everything. Uh, and all the designers are basically developers as well. Like, so if you do visuals, you also do the implementation. Maybe not the JavaScript, but at least design and CSS. So with that said, uh, let's look at some good CSS conventions. Before we do that, let's talk about specificity. The question is really, when does one selector override, override another? And this, trust me, is not philosophy. It's not a philosophy question. There is science behind this. 
And I'll just do a very quick demo to get us on the same page about how specificity it works, right? So uh, this is a small tool that Josh Peake built at GitHub. He'd probably be embarrassed if he knew I was showing this to you today. So basically, only look at this number down here to the right. Can you all see that? Yeah. Yay, perfect. Right, so um, uh, hopefully uh, this is more speed. So if we have a paragraph, for example, that's just uh, a one, right? Specificity is a numbers game. The highest number wins, and if it's the same number and you just get defined later, the latest definition or the latest def uh, selector wins. So if you have an element and another element, uh, you just have two, and the third element, yeah, you just get three, right? That's easy. Um, classes are worth 10. Same with attribute selectors, right? So if you have something like this, it's also 10. And ID is 100, right? And you can combine them in any way. And it doesn't actually affect where you put these in the chain. It's going to be the same, right? So if we have ID here or ID here, it's the same specificity. Um, but a tricky one is absolutely doing something like this, right? Looks more general than a class but actually isn't, right? So you have 11 here, whereas this is 10. Right. Uh, so this is basic. Hopefully, we're up to speed somewhat. On top of that, let's talk about some good success conventions. Don't use important. Uh, it doesn't solve anything, right? You're just shooting yourself in the foot. So if, for example, you had this example where you were trying to override an element and an attribute selector with just a class selector and it doesn't work, do not add important. The proper way to solve this is just like add the element to the class selector as well. You have the same, and since it's defined after, it's going to work. Two, avoid adjoining classes. Uh, this is, uh, for example, here, if we're trying to do an input big on search input, what you're really saying is, in this specific case, uh, when these are together, uh, set this font size, then you should just do this. And it performs better, and it's easier uh, to work with and do tests on. Uh, so avoid joining classes. Separate selling JavaScript, this is specific to, to CSS, right? So you probably already do this, but when you do, never, ever, ever style those JS classes, right? Always add specific classes for styling and for JavaScript. Four, prefer direct descendant selectors. So if you have something like this, this is actually uh, better in many ways if A is a direct child of header, right? It performs better. Uh, and it also bloats your style sheets less, right? So it's easier to work with in the end. But then again, you shouldn't nest at all, right? So try to avoid nesting. And if you have this, you should probably just add a class to uh, that um, A element, for example, head to link, and be done with it, right? So avoid nesting at all. The problem really is with SAS and less, it's like a reflex that every, everyone does this. You have something like this, right? You have uh, nav, ul, li, a. That's easy. And then you replicate the exact same hierarchy with SAS. Do not do this. It's not a good idea. It reads read bad. It doesn't perform well. And we do not need a hierarchy like this for CSS to function, right? So the proper way to fix this would first to be just to uh, remove that ally from the UL and the A. But then really what we should do is we should go back here and just add specific classes to all of these, right? So we have nav items, nav item, and nav item link. Uh, we go back, add those here, and then actually just remove the wrapper now because we're not styling that anyway. And now we have um, code that's really easy to understand and read. It's easier to reuse. It performs better and easier to test. And we're going to be back to testing later, right? So uh, classes, better than IDs. You gain nothing, basically, by using an ID. Use classes for styling. Look out for complicated selectors. You may have done this at some point and be like, shit, I'm so good at CSS. <laughs> This looks great. Also, no. Uh, <laughs> maybe you're trying to do something like if you have a table view, and if the last row you have zebra styling or something, and the last row doesn't work with your HR selectors, so you're trying to do something like this. You're just lazy, right? You should just go back and add this class specifically to the element and put the logic in the markup instead of the CSS. So watch out for those. Uh, also, the same basically with a star selector. It's legit to use this with a global reset, but as soon as you're doing that in a container, for example, you're probably doing something wrong somewhere else. So look out for those. They perform real bad, and it's just a good indicator that you're actually doing something wrong. 
So most people usually talk about the selectors when we talk about CSS, right? But uh, let's actually talk about some good properties conventions. Uh, so use shorthands when available. This, uh, for example, there's a shorthand for line height. Many forget that there is because you may see this. You'd be like, font, 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 that makes sense. Line height, uh-huh, that is its own thing. It's not, right? So we can collapse all those three to font bold, 12 pixel Helvetica Noia. We could also just bring up line height there and do font size slash uh, line height. So keep those in mind, but don't use shorthands if they set values you don't need to set. So a lot of uh, people just sprinkle margin zero. You probably do this. I did this. Uh, margin zero and padding zero, because like, why not? Let's just reset everything. That's not a good way in the end, right, to code. So um, try to be very explicit about what you're trying to reset. Both so you know when you go back later, it's like, why is this margin zero here, right? So set it only for the values you need them to. So set uh, explicitly a direction for margin, same for padding. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, automate only on the GPU. This is basically just as soon as you do transform or animation, try to only use these two. Uh, you can basically do anything with those, so, so don't worry. Uh, but that makes sure everything performs really well. 10, remove redundant properties. This is also classic. Uh, if you have display block and then set position absolute or float left or even better, first in line to do something and then float left, that's not going to change anything at all. Right? So that's just a redundant property. Uh, float left or float any direction and position absolute specifically forces your element to be a uh, block. Right? So that does nothing. Just skip those and do this. Whew. Uh, divide single class names with a single. Oh, I actually removed that slide. So yay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, naming conventions are just bullshit. So let's talk about testing and linting. Uh, let me just uh, have a quick drink. <sighs> Perfect. Testing and linting. So. This is where this stuff gets really interesting, because you could do this in your own project, and you'll be fine. But as soon as you have a big project with tons of people and everyone touching everything, uh, it gets messy real quick, right? So at GitHub, um, we use, uh, or they, uh, Saslin, which is basically, this is how they describe their own tool, right? A configurable tool for writing clean and consistent CSS. So, it's not, so it doesn't really affect how you structure things and the quality of things. It's more like it's consistent. It's not wrong. Um, it does, though, though, have support for selected depth. So you could just say that the max depth is three, and this, for example, wouldn't build. Right? This would fail. You'd be forced to at least remove the A to a, a separate level. But we can do better. right? So we could uh, duplicate selectors on the same level, just remove those. Right? So if we have something like this, uh, test for this. If this ever happens, you define something, and then you define something else, and then you forgot you defined the first thing, so you define it again. Um, this fails on GitHub, GitHub, right? You have to merge them so they are one and the same. That's basic. Then, a, a Robin is writing a lot of the tests for GitHub, GitHub, and basically, how we do is that um, either he just comes up with them himself, or the front end team asks someone specifically to write new tests, and then we try to slowly get them in in a working condition into GitHub, GitHub. So this is one of those unused classes. It's just basically parsing uh, with regex. Uh, Everything is being rendered on GitHub, GitHub. And looking for classes and matching those against JS and, and the style sheets, right? So if it finds a class that isn't being used, it's just there in the markup, but it's not being referenced either in JS or in CSS, it's going to fail. Um, also, the other way around, if you're styling something that doesn't ever appear in, in the markup, it's going to fail. Same with JS. Uh, with that said, this is really hard to run tests on, right? For this to work, you'd have to first find header and then parse the entire DOM every time you find that and look for UL and LIs. That doesn't really scale and work, and it's just redundant, right? So that's another reason to just try to use as many top-level classes as possible, uh, because it makes testing so much easier. So that's why we prefer this. Also, unnecessary nesting. So this is a trickier problem to solve that we spend some time trying to figure out. So the question is really, how do you look for unnecessary nesting? So if I would manually look through a CSS file or a SAS file, and I'd see this. Someone first defining basically a context, and then within that, defining another selector that defines the context again. You mean like this overview header thing is probably only used within over, uh, overview, 
So uh, we probably don't need to nest this. This should just be a top-level class. So how do you write a test to figure that out? So this test is actually an experimental test. We worked a lot with to make uh, this just get up, get up, pass the test. It hasn't passed yet, but working with this, um, I loved it. We found so many issues which can just fix automatically. So hopefully they will make it pass soon. But the idea is to disallow nesting of any unique class. Right? So if you have this, a selector, and within another selector, you override that, that's fine. That's completely fine. That passes. You could maybe use that in this case, like you define a button, and then within the sidebar, you just change the color of that button. That's legit. But if you do this, you don't have the first declaration of that button. You only have it defined within sidebar. That's going to fail. You're not going to be able to actually do that. So if you're only using it once anyway, it should just be a top level class. So it's quite an aggressive test. Um, but my experience is as it's really good. And this is just a regex running on um, as a CI uh, process on GitHub GitHub. So let's uh, talk about refactoring. So I'm going to do a design right here. I, I hope uh, that's fine with you. I love refactoring CSS. And refactoring CSS is always an opportunity to refactor the design as well. And I really want people to start looking at design and not think like, oh, I'm not a design. I'm not going to touch that. But see design as a set of rules just as code is, right? It's, it's logic to it. You can find inconsistencies and just fix visual bugs constantly. Not obvious things that this is completely off. Take it to the next level and look at consistencies. The thing is, we spend so much time adding features and think that's the most valuable thing in our products, right? And I have this thing that I love doing, which is removing things. And if you ever ask me, should I remove something, I'll say yes. Like A, B, R, A, always B, B, R, removing, always be removing, always be removing. And I'm not talking about making things flat. Like, like, like the iOS community spent a year removing all the gradients. That's not really the essence of it. There's a thing we remove too much, so you don't know how something works anymore. And that's just going to be <laughs> really nasty. right? You do not want to end up here. And, and so for example, at GitHub, we use a lot of shadows, because shadows are great for communicating hierarchy. right? Things should be obvious, not clean, as in flat, and everything's gone. Obvious, hopefully both. But don't confuse lack of visual complexity with something that's easy to use, because that's what Microsoft did with Metro, right? So you have this very flat, nice thing, but you can't really turn it off. For example, um, you end up with this. So we want to avoid this, but we want to remove things. Um, <laughs> it never gets old. Uh, <laughs> Remove things that obstruct the original message, right? Um, not the other way around. So let's remove some things and clean up real quick uh, some CSS. Um, so uh, here it is. Wow. This is so small. Right. So this is the, the Ruby gem site that's live right now. And uh, typically, if I would, if this, this would be GitHub GitHub, <laughs> I would just start poking around with this tool. This is Espresso for Mac. And it's really good because you can really easily see all the selectors that, uh, that are affecting an element. And you can skip uh, inheritance, basically. So these are only selectors in this pop over here uh, that are affecting this element, right? So um, you just start looking for things with weird uh, selectors. So this is actually a good example. We have here um, two selectors uh, basically for the same element, right? So we have this green thing. And instead of doing um, uh, setting the context here twice, you could just go in here and add a class to that instead. Uh, let's call it main header. Can you see this? No. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so we have main header here, and we just add that class um, here as well. And then we can think of this long thing and just do a main header, right? So that's great. But as a designer, uh, you'd also have to question like what, what they are doing here. It's, it looks basically like a button, right? 
is a big green thing. So let's start trying to clean up the visuals and also uh, the CSS. So if you look at this, there's a background image. We can just try to get rid of that. And the borders. Try to make this look as text, because it is. Um, then, right, most headers are bold by default, so we could just try that. That worked. Nothing changed. Uh, text align. Everything is text align center in this box, so we could probably kill this property here as well. Um, that made nothing. Uh, margin, no. <laughs> Two things transforming the text. Let's kill both of those. OK, that actually changed something, but uh, let's actually just go in here and uh, fix that. Uh, all right. And then we got, uh, what, padding. That's actually legit. Uh, color, legit. No background color, no radius. All right, so uh, <laughs> there's not a lot left. And, but this is typically how we would do something um, on GitHub GitHub, right? And then I would start to look for certain patterns that usually are just visual bugs, right? So uh, if we start looking around at this site, we see things that are mentioned twice. And you can usually just remove those without asking anyone. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, because no one will care, right? So for example, in the header, we have your community gem host, right? And then we have the same thing here. Welcome to your community gem host. So we can just remove that. Another pattern. Uh, which uh, you see everywhere, which is great because as soon as you see it, you can like remove so much both CSS and visual complexity. Is boxes within boxes, boxes within boxes. So we have one box here. Oh, this is really hard. Um, and then within that, we have another box with learn and share. All right. So what the designer is probably trying to do here is just divide the top content from the bottom content, but accidentally also within, with this process creating a lot of noise around here, right? We do not need that. We just need two divisions. So if you kill the box within the box and just do a box followed by another box, you can win a lot of that uh, doing that. So I just did that real quick here. Uh, and that's always basically a rule that works every single time. As soon as you have a box within a box, kill the first box. Uh, and it's just always better. Uh, right, so that's, that's the design rant. Um, don't forget the properties when you're refactoring CSS. There's a lot of talk about the selectors. But killing properties and just focusing on that, you could probably, if you're lucky, kill the entire selector after a while, right? Um, so the question is really, especially in, on a project, a big project like GitHub GitHub, when to refactor something. Like you can, you can always find stuff that's wrong, but people are doing new features all the time. How do you know when it's actually time to just hit the brakes and be like, shit, we need to refactor this? So graphs, graphs are great. Graphs don't tell you why something is wrong, or how it's wrong, or what happened, but it tells you something <laughs> happened. Uh, so for example, uh, there's, there's basically a framework within GitHub where you can share and build graphs real easily. So here's one. Uh, was just the number of selectors over time. And it's about two months of work here. And we see uh, here to the left, it's about 7,200 selectors. And then two months of work, uh, killing 600. Ugh. So it's, it's slow work. But so here we saw a peak, right? Um, so basically, I would, while I get up, just wake up in the morning and see if there was a peak. Hopefully, there wasn't. But if there was one, could just go into uh, the pull request tab, basically, and watch for resend merges. The thing is, with GitHub, there's a lot of people merging stuff. Uh, so this is basically the only way to, to stay up to date with what's happening. Uh, so uh, we found the issue. It was basically an extend going real and really. Do not use extends. Stay away from them. Uh, and then managed to burn a lot of CSS just by doing some copy pasting and using mixins instead. So stay away from extends. Um, this graph is actually really interesting. It's the same data here at the top, but we also track the, the, um, the score of the selector, so basically how good the selector is. So the best selector you could get is the green here. It's just a class, a single class. So basically, you're looking for the green to go up and the rest to go down. The stripes here in the back that making this graph very uh, difficult to read is um, 
deploys. So this is, I think, a typical day, right? So this is Europe having fun, and then all the MPs in the US waking up. So there's a lot of things going on constantly. Uh, so basically, you have, we have to have these tools uh, to, to make sure that we uh, find issues real quick. Uh, this is the last graph I'm going to show you. Uh, this is um, just file size over time as well, and using that as a tool. And sometimes you may, may think you're doing a really nice refactor, but you end up with a bigger file size, uh, which is a good lesson. Uh, but here we've also gone from about 80 to 70K for the onset during two months. Uh, so just, that's basically just killing properties, right? That's the biggest thing you kill there. So just killing properties can, can make the page load faster, which is awesome. That's it. I'm done. Thank you for listening.